And I am the African American Interpretation and Special Projects Coordinator here at Mount Vernon. I am so pleased that you've joined us today as we reflect on the significant exhibit of Lives Bound Together, Slavery at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. On display since October 2016, it explores the personal stories of the people enslaved at Mount Vernon while providing insight into George Washington's evolving opposition to slavery. While the last day to see Lives Bound Together in person at the Donald W. Reynolds Museum and Education Center will be July 11th, much of the content will be available virtually on our website. And we will drop that link into the Lives Bound Together online in the chat shortly. Now, for you, we have assembled a fantastic panel to talk about the process of curating the material and information, as well as continual research and efforts to elevate the stories of the enslaved population at Mount Vernon and beyond. So let's introduce them. We have Kimberly Robinson. She is currently serving as museum curator at the George Washington Memorial Parkway, a National Park Service unit of the Washington metropolitan area that includes Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial and the Clara Barton National Historic Site. She graduated from George Washington University's Museum Studies graduate mm -hmm. program with a master's of arts degree with a concentration in collections management in 2006. Her research interests are focused on the 19th century fine and decorative arts, as well as architecture, in particular, the art, architecture and design of the Victorian era. Ms. Robinson has given numerous talks on historic homes and museum collections management and recently taught collections management at George Washington University. <laughs> Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to a great panel tonight. Hello, Brenda. <laughs> Hello. Next, we have Steve Hammond. Steve Hammond is a retired federal employee, having spent his entire 40-year career as an earth scientist with the United States Geological Survey. He is now a scientist emeritus with the agency. Stephen swapped his full-time geology work for genealogy and family history research. Now, his goals are to educate and to inspire others to document their own family stories. He is a seventh generation member of the Syfax family of Washington, D.C., a line that moved by force to New Orleans and then by choice to Denver. He has participated in a variety of National Park Service programs at Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial to highlight the lives of his Syfax ancestors and other enslaved Americans on the estate. He has spoken at the African American Civil War Museum and at the historic Decatur House on Lafayette Square, both in Washington, D.C., and has contributed to the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, as well as the Lives Bound Together exhibit here at Mount Vernon. Steve is a charter member of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage and a member of the African American Historical and Genealogical Society and the Louisiana Historical Society. He currently serves as a trustee for the Arlington House Foundation. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Brenda. Thanks for having me this evening. It's great to be here with everybody. Always great to have you. Now we have Jesse McLeod, who joined Mount Vernon's curatorial staff in 2016 after receiving a Master of Arts in History with a certificate in public history from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She previously received a BA in history from Yale University and has worked at numerous historic sites interpreting 18th and 19th century American history. Now at Mount Vernon, Jesse served as lead curator for the award-winning exhibition, Lives Bound Together, Slavery at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Now, welcome, Jesse. <laughs> yes, always. Now to kick things off, I would like for each of the panelists to take a little time to talk about their work as it relates to the exhibition. Jesse, why don't you start? Sure. Um, well, thanks, Brenda, and hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming tonight. I wanted to just give a brief overview of the exhibition um, in case some of you haven't seen it or as a refresher for those of you um, who may have seen it some time ago. Um, as many of you know, Lives Bound Together 
was Mount Vernon's first major exhibit on slavery. Um, and here you can see the entrance doors to the exhibit. And you can see that we have on these entrance doors the names of some of the more than 500 people who were enslaved at Mount Vernon over the course of George Washington's residence there. And by looking at these names um, from this vantage point, you can see through them to see the bust of Washington in the first gallery. And this really uh, embodies our approach um, to telling this story in the exhibition. You really, in order to understand George Washington's life and his legacy, you have to consider the people who uh, lived and labored on his plantation. So the exhibit explores how enslaved labor contributed to the operation of the Mount Vernon plantation, how George Washington's views on slavery changed over the course of his life, culminating in his decision to free his slaves and his will, and then how enslaved people themselves carved out lives for themselves within the system of bondage. So at the beginning of the exhibition, we show um, this infographic, um, which should be coming up next, um, which shows the population of Mount Vernon in 1799, which was the last year of Washington's life. And the green color represents Washington family members. The red represents hired white servants and their families. And the blue represents enslaved men, women, and children. So in that year, there were 317 people enslaved on the property. They made up more than 90% of the population. Um, so looking at this, looking at these numbers, you know, it really emphasizes the importance of slavery to the operation of this place and how important that story is um, to, to Washington's life. So one of the main goals of the exhibit, as you can see in this um, next, to look at objects in our collection through a different lens. So we wanted to take some of the decorative arts that we have, like this silver hot water urn or this French porcelain tea service, and think about how they're also connected. I guess we're saying we want to think about how they're also connected mm -hmm. to the Washingtons mm -hmm. and the Washingtons world. Mm -hmm. We'd like to move on. Let's go ahead and um, move on with um, Steve, if she doesn't come back. There we go. Let me give her a minute to come back. OK. I'm going to take this so yeah, yeah. Well, she'll be back in a moment here. Mm -hmm. So my background is I'm a genealogist and a family historian. I spent a 40 year career, as Brenda said, with the U.S. Geological Survey. And um, I'm just loving being in this space of uh, genealogy and family history research. I'm interested in the lives of my Syfax ancestors uh, and, and their movements in this particular area and where they kind of ended up in the course of the 19th, 20th, 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think of this area as a scenic byway for the Syfaxes. You know, the Syfaxes uh, uh, are known to be, um, have, have been enslaved at a number of sites and had lived in a number of sites that include the Decatur House there off of Lafayette Square, and the Arlington House, clearly, uh, the Carlisle House in Alexandria. And the Mount Vernon is kind of a, a special kind of conundrum for the Syfaxes is that our family history tells us that people were there, but we're, we don't have hard information that shows how they moved around that space. And so one of my interests is really trying to continue to discover documents um, mm -hmm. to, to tease out uh, the history of the Syfaxes with um, Mount Vernon. The other thing that I've been doing recently is I actually have established an organization called Syfax Pathfinders. And the Syfax Pathfinders is intended to create opportunities to learn and educate the public. You know, I want to highlight the values of getting to know your own family history and kind of through the through the research and sharing of the information with the Syfax to inspire others to look at their own family history. 
And I want to the I want to honor the significance of uh, the legacy of folklore, you know, in terms of what we know and what we don't know. And a lot of times that doesn't figure in very heavily when we think about history and how we tell stories about people. So that's really important. Yeah. And then I want to employ tools and technology that will help us to evaluate folklore and other parts of our family history. So I'm really excited to be in this space and to talk about the uh, the exhibit as it closes and uh, and where we go from here. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Kimberly? Hello, and uh, good evening, um, everyone. As I mentioned before, Brenda, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you so much for having me to represent my agency to talk a bit about the work we've been doing at Arlington House for the last few years and how we've definitely been following along the path that was first laid out by Val Brennan. So thank you for having me again. Um, so as um, Brenda said, I am a museum curator with the National Park Service at the George Washington Memorial Parkway which is a 25 mile scenic byway that encompasses portion that has park units in Washington DC, Maryland, and here in Virginia. Um, so I've been at Arlington House, the site we're talking about tonight since 2012 as museum curator. And before I talk a bit about what we've been doing for the last few years at the site, working with descend descendants of the enslaved like Steve, um, we, I wanted to talk about a bit about how, uh, how is Arlington House connected to Mount Vernon because many folks might not know that. Um, so the original owner of Arlington House was actually George Washington Park Custis. He was the adopted grandson of President Washington and mother of Martha Washington's grandchildren from her first marriage, um, via her first marriage. Um, so he grew up in Mount Vernon as a child with his sister, Eleanor Park Custis. If you've been on the tour, you've probably heard of Nellie and Washi. So Washi, of course, became, is George Washington Park Custis. And when, after the death of President Washington and the following with the death of Martha Washington, he moved out of Mount Vernon and took one of his father's properties in the area we know today as Arlington. Um, he, it was built between 1802 and 1818, and he built it as an early memorial prior to the Washington Monument, I'd like to mention, mm -hmm. um, to President Washington. Right. So, and of course, him and his young wife, Molly Fitzhugh, um, they moved there to start a home and start raising a family. Um, however, they weren't, of course, the only ones that came to um, Arlington House. They also came with many of those who were once enslaved at Mount Vernon. And it was their labor that built the Arlington House and its subsequent dependencies, the historic slave quarters. So the last few years, we've been on a journey um, working thanks to a donation from David and Rubenstein, um, famous venture capitalist, historic philanthropist. He's been very generous to Mount Vernon as well. We love him. Um, and, um, he um, donated to the National Park Foundation $12.35 million to facilitate an extensive rehabilitation of the historic main house, the historic slave quarters, as well as our grounds to make them more accessible, but also for the purposes of tonight's discussion to really expand the stories that we tell. Um, a lot of folks don't know that Robert E. Lee comes into the story very late into the history, and he's only a small part of the stories that we tell, but we felt that our interpretation as it was didn't necessarily really explicitly get into that. Um, so for the last about five or six years now, we've been working with our partners in the descendant community, our partners in the museum community, as well as, the, as well as within the park service to make sure we're uplifting all the stories of Arlington, the stories of the enslaved, women's history, and many other stories in a way that we didn't do before. Um, and I definitely, as I said at the beginning, a lot of that is following on the coattails of what you guys did in Mount Vernon and other sites as well that have done this work, but we'll get into that later. But with that, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Jesse, would you like to complete um, um, doing the presentation? I'm like so interested and I'm sure everybody out there viewing is as well. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. I managed to get through the whole pandemic until now without having any major technical difficulties <laughs> on a video call. So I, I think I can call that a success, but my apologies. Um, so yes, I, as I was saying, um, one goal for this exhibition was to reframe some of the objects in our collection to consider their connections to slavery in ways that might be unexpected or new to many of our visitors. And so we have decorative arts objects like a silver hot water urn or a porcelain tea service. Um, and we can really think about how those are connected to slavery, whether it's through the people who would have been cleaning, polishing, holding, moving them, or through the products that they held like sugar or coffee or chocolate, which were all harvested with enslaved labor. In addition, in this uh, photograph, you can see one major element of the exhibition, which is 19 life-size silhouettes that each represent a specific person who was enslaved at Mount Vernon. And these are conjectural because, of course, we don't have images of enslaved people, unfortunately. 
Um, but we wanted to use these to showcase these individual stories because we have a tremendous amount of research that allows us to reconstruct the lives of many of the people who were enslaved on the property. So here you can see Frank Lee, who was the enslaved butler, who had a really important role in the operation of the household. And then on the next screen, you can see his brother, um, William Lee, or excuse me, the, the following <laughs> the following image um, shows his brother, William Lee, um, who was Washington's personal um, manservant who was with him throughout all seven years of the war. Um, and William Lee was actually the only enslaved person who was freed immediately at George Washington's will. Um, the rest of the community was freed upon Martha's death. Um, and if you go back to the previous image, you can see that each of these silhouettes is paired with a, an interactive touch screen that allows visitors to explore the person's biography in more detail. So it has um, specific references to them in primary sources, as well as a family tree, which shows their relationships um, and their descendants, if we know of them. Um, the largest gallery, um, which is uh, uh, this one that you see here, focuses, focuses on daily life for enslaved people at Mount Vernon. Um, so most enslaved people were assigned to the outlying farms of the 8,000 acre plantation doing agricultural labor. Um, and so here um, we explore a lot of archeological artifacts that relate to their lives, many of them excavated from the site of a slave quarter. And this really provides a window into how the people who lived in that space made lives for themselves, acquired objects and belongings that may have added some measure of comfort or convenience to their everyday lives. And these are some of the only objects that we can trace directly to the enslaved community. So they're very powerful for that reason. We also have a gallery devoted to manuscripts um, from Washington's papers. Um, Washington was a meticulous record keeper um, and many of those records were saved. And so we have an enormous amount of material, as I mentioned, that allows us to reconstruct a lot of these stories. And even in documents that aren't explicitly about slavery, there are often mentions of a specific person or references to the operation of the plantation. Um, so there's an enormous um, body of, of research. And so we've been able to display some of those items in this gallery. And then the final gallery, which you see here, is focused on um, Washington's decision to free his slaves in his will and the impact that that had on the enslaved community. So as Kim mentioned, um, some of the people who were here were actually owned by the Custis estate. They weren't owned directly by Washington. And so Washington didn't have the legal authority to free them. And that had enormous ramifications. It meant that the enslaved community was divided after George and Martha Washington's deaths. And some of those individuals were sent to places like Arlington House. And so that's where the connection between Mount Vernon and Arlington House begins. And so in this gallery, we explore the story of um, the Custis estate. We also explore what happened to those who were freed by Washington's will. Um, and then at the very end of this gallery, we have an oral history video, which shows interviews with descendants like Steve, um, who are able to share their stories, share their family histories. Um, and it really allows us to, you know, tie this story to the present to show that, you know, this remains relevant both as people's family history, um, but also as a complicated part of George Washington's legacy that we continue to grapple with. So that's the brief overview of the exhibition. And I know as we continue the conversation, we'll have a chance to talk more about what went into developing it as well as where we're going from here. Excellent. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate that. All right. Now the big question about all of these, um, all of these exhibits and everything that we're talking about today is why? Why did Mount Vernon decide to do an exhibit on slavery? Jesse? Yeah, so there are a number of reasons. I'd say one of the biggest was simply audience interest. We get so many questions about slavery. It's really something that visitors who are coming to Mount Vernon and other plantation sites are interested in. Um, so, you know, at the baseline, it was simply to answer a lot of those questions. Um, but for us, it was also a logical next step in terms of the research that had been ongoing and other interpretation and programming that we had done. So many of you may be familiar with Mary Thompson, whose mm -hmm. book on slavery at Mount Vernon came out a couple years ago. And she has been researching this topic for about 40 years. A long time. Yeah, she is yeah. Really, 
the expert. And so her research was, was there and there was so much in there, so many amazing stories. And we really wanted to bring those forward um, and share those in a way that would reach as many visitors as possible. And then we really wanted to show, um, you know, how important, as I mentioned, um, when I was showing images of the exhibit, how important slavery was to this place and to George Washington's life. And, you know, it is important to grapple with the complexity of life in the 18th century and this um, horrible institution that was deeply ingrained in the society that George Washington lived in. So um, in order to portray his life authentically and accurately, we really have to, to face that difficult part of, of the past. Um, and I'm sure Kim has um, perhaps some similar reasons, but maybe other reasons for um, initiating your exhibit, which um, covers similar territory. No, um, absolutely. Um, you're saying, you know, you're going, you, what you described is exactly the same process that we went through at Arlington House. Um, I do want to give credit where credit is due for a long time. Our staff in the field, our interpreters had worked to do special programs and have special events mm -hmm. with our partners in the defending community and to really tell these stories, but it was temporary, it was ephemeral, and it wasn't something that people could really imagine and really understand that Arlington House, which is today located within Arlington National Cemetery, was an 1,100 acre plantation estate where, you know, 60 to 100 people may have lived at any given time under this institution, this system. And um, we really wanted to do justice to that and create a sense of what it was like in going up until 1861 when Robert E. Lee resigned um, and kicked off the Civil War. And we know what happened after that. Um, but it was a real, um, really a real struggle um, to really do justice to the story, to make sure that we were giving a voice to the enslaved and not just featuring it from the perspective of Robert E. Lee and his family, because that was what had been done for way too long. Um, so it was a multi-year journey to make sure we were getting it right and we did not get it perfectly. Um, but we do think that um, what we managed to pull together um, with our community partners is something that will um, be a stepping stone to a, a continued um, partnership with our Only Town Foundation, with the community, and with our interpreters who are working in the field every day. Excellent, thank you. So um, ladies, um, when you're talking about um, these particular exhibits, you said the why was basically because the visitors, the guests, the people that came, um, they wanted to have answers to these particular things. So are you basically saying that these exhibits, um, specifically Lives Bound Together was part of a larger trend in the museum field? I think that's definitely true. I've certainly noticed, um, you know, there are a number of sites that that have been expanding their efforts to interpret this this topic in the last, mm -hmm. even in the last decade or two. And I think increasingly in the last, you know, five years, as um, you know, the topic of of race in America has come become an even more urgent question for a lot of people, or people are starting to notice what was there all along. I should say. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, I, I think it is people are really starting to pay attention to the gaps that have existed for a long time in the narrative that has been told about American history. Um, and there's also been more research being done, you know, new questions are being asked. Um, you know, all, all of these things are kind of coming together to, to make it easier to tell these stories. And there's also mm -hmm. increased funding for topics like this. Um, you know, generous people like David Rubenstein are taking an interest and that allows projects to happen. Um, so yeah, I think all of those things have, have really come together to um, help make this a larger trend, which is great. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I fully agree with that. Um, I know when we kicked off the planning for our current exhibits in 2015, we consulted with um, the folks at Mount Vernon as well as um, a curators at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and also looked at what Montpelier, um, James Madison's Montpelier and um, Monticello were doing um, mm -hmm. to see what we can learn um, from their experiences with, especially with community engagement and um, just like being expansive in the story that we're telling. Um, because I don't have to tell you as a federal agency, we're not always quick at the draw. So it takes time sometimes to implement change. Um, so, you know, working, learning from our predecessors really helped our process. And also um, I think there's been in the last few decades, uh, more appreciation and understanding for the value of oral history. And because of like, one of the challenges in the past is there's not a lot of written documentation and records as it relates mm -hmm. to African American history and the story of enslavement in this country. So using and leveraging oral history and taking into account 
the passed down oral traditions of the families of those who were once enslaved at our site in particular um, was really something that helped, you know, was a trend that we were able to take advantage of as well. Can I add something to that as well? I, I think, at kind of, kind of following on what Kim said, I think voices of the descendants are, are, are having an impact on this as well. You know, for a long time, people's voices haven't had an opportunity to get out there, and descendants are finding one another, and it, uh, you know, it's helping to. You'll hear you hear me say a few times this this evening that we're we're working to try to amplify our voices so that these stories, uh, you know, get more have more gravitas in this space. Yes, definitely. Um, excellent. So you've got the why and you've got um, what you're trying to do. Um, what did the exhibit um, development process look like? Um, Jesse, would you like to start? Yeah, so I think a lot of people don't realize that exhibits like Lives Bound Together, which is almost 5,000 square feet, seven galleries, hundreds of objects, it takes a really long time to put all of that together. So we were we were planning for over three years before the exhibit actually opened. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a really complex process, collaboration with a lot of different people. So um, we started with that amazing body of research, um, most of it generated by Mary Thompson. Um, and we were able to think about how to craft that into a narrative, which objects to display, um, we, from very early on, we also wanted to collaborate with the descendant community um, to get their perspectives, make sure that their voices were part of the process. Um, uh -huh. Because of course, you know, they have a unique perspective that we as, as staff don't have. So that was really critical as we were considering how to present the story. We also, um, you know, worked with a designer to come up with, you know, all the little things like fonts and color schemes and, you know, what do the panels look like? They're all, everything is a decision when it comes to an exhibition like this. So um, it's a really long process of back and forth, um, considering the best way to present these stories. Um, we did focus groups um, where we showed certain design elements like the silhouettes um, to, to a group of people to make sure that they were responding to them in the way that we had hoped. And with feedback from those sessions, we were able to make changes that really improved the outcome of the exhibit, which was an exciting um, thing to include. We hadn't really done that for an exhibit before. So um, that was that was really um, uh, an exciting part of the process. Um, and then we also were able to, um, as the exhibit was being developed, we were continuing um, to expand our research efforts. And one thing that I'll mention that was going on kind of simultaneously was the development of a database, a research database that compiled information on the enslaved community. So we had a body of research from Mary that was kind of narrative, um, uh, kind of, you know, um, narratives of individual biographies of, of you know, topic related um, content, but what the database did was it basically took every mention of an enslaved person in George Washington's records um, and tagged it to the person who was mentioned um, so that it could be um, placed in a searchable database. So basically what you can do is look up a specific person and see every single time that they appear in George Washington's records. Or you can look up a specific topic like agricultural labor or childbirth or um, you know, carpentry, <laughs> carpentry, yeah, whatever it is. Um, and you can find all the mentions of that particular topic, um, as well as, you know, the people who were involved. So putting it in, putting the research in that format really made it possible for us to very quickly kind of assemble all the resources on a particular person or on a particular topic, um, and to ask different questions about the content. Um, so that was a really exciting way that the exhibit kind of accelerated progress in, in a different arena. Um, but in general, yes, so the, the, the exhibit was a, it was a very long process to develop it. Um, it finally opened in October 2016. Um, and we've been so excited that it's been able to be on view for um, four and a half years. It was initially going to be up for two years. And so it's been ex extended several times, which is really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it was um, it was a lot of collaboration um, and a lot of uh, a lot of work, but it resulted in you know a, a great product. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, can I, I'll add a couple of things here. You know, first of all, when it opened, I think it opened on the same day as the African American <laughs> Museum of History and Culture, it's you know, so it was like, it's my birthday, I, September it was like 24th. all of those, yeah. all those <laughs> things were happening around the same time. And so it, it was yeah. a pretty exciting period of time in terms of what that kind of looked like. Um, you know, I wanted to add, you know, the database, I think, is a really important part of this as they were picking apart uh, diaries and, and looking at places where all of this information existed independently. It's nice to try to aggregate it so, um, you know, future historians and uh, scholars can pick this information mm -hmm. apart. And I, I actually went into the database today and I, I actually did a count of all the, the lines in there. And there's something on the order of about 22,000 records that are in that database, which mm -hmm. I think is really no small feat in terms of pulling mm -hmm. that information together. You know, it, and it's a start. There are things that we can do to enhance that, and we'll continue to work on that, but it's a wonderful start in terms of where we're at. Um, I would also say that the use of objects is, I think, a big challenge here when you consider how much uh, we don't know about the enslaved. You know, there are a few, there are people that we know more about than others, and so the yeah. use of interpreting people um, uh, through the use of objects, I think, is a really an important part of that, and I think the exhibit has done a good job of, I'm going to get out of the sun here, um, in terms of how, in terms of how, uh, you know, we tell stories and help people to relate to that. And then the last thing, something that Jesse didn't mention is that there was a period in which they actually interviewed uh, multiple descendants. And I, I was actually one of those, but I, I wanted to take a second to, to, to acknowledge that Ann Chin, uh, who was a Twine descendant, was uh, um, interviewed. Uh, Phyllis Ford, who was a Jasper mm -hmm. descendant, was interviewed. Uh, Zoni Matema uh, was a Branham descendant. Uh, Roe and Jay Quander were a part of that, as well as myself. And so I, I think that that's a start. And, and one of the things that we, I think, want to do as we go forward is to try to get more voices that are a part of that. Mm, excellent. Kim, would you like to speak to a little bit more of the development process for you all? Absolutely. And I've just been nodding along as uh, Jesse and Steve have been going through their experiences because, you know, it's as so much, you know, our experience definitely echoes the process that Malvernon went through when they were developing Lifestyle together. Um, I would just add that we had a two extra layers of fun. We had government bureaucracy and we also had <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, the adventure of trying to do a major rehabilitation of uh, four historic buildings and one new one and, and build one new one in addition to concurrently planning new exhibits. So we created that problem for ourselves. In the um, COVID and, environment. And, and then of course, when we were moving the museum collections back, that was right when everything started shutting down for COVID-19. So it's been fun. No. You did it though. We did it, we did it. Uh, it's, 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 <laughs> we did it, but, um, but yeah, um, our process uh, was very much so similar to what um, the team at Mount Vernon went through. Um, we really, at least in the beginning, so it didn't go perfectly. We tried to emphasize uh, community engagement by having a historian's roundtable to kick off the planning for our project. And um, one of the things we had, we had a consultant designer who came in to help us design the exhibit, Healy Kohler, based in Maryland. And um, we wanted to have fresh research and fresh perspectives because um, uh, we felt that a lot of our previous research had had a certain bias and, you know, had only had a kind of a limited scope. So we wanted to get the latest scholarship and the latest perspectives um, on African-American history and enslavement on what Robert E. Lee and the conflicting views about him, as well as on President Washington and his, his story and how that intertwines with Arlington House. So we kicked off our project with a round table and the, all of the information gathered from that fed into our um, schematic design, the preliminary plan and foundation for what would later become the exhibit. Um, throughout the process, we were able to not only have physical exhibits, interpretive panels, as well as outdoor waysides, um, but we were able to leverage the buildings. Um, one thing that's different about Arlington is that mm -hmm. we don't have a visitor center or education center. So we had to use the historic spaces to install the exhibits. Um, so we were able to have both traditional museum gallery spaces, as well as have certain rooms be period rooms to really showcase how mm -hmm. not only the Custis and Lee families live, but also how the enslaved live, at least for the two structures that we have that are still standing. Um, so that was one of the things we were able to leverage with this new project was to properly furnish and really is exhibit all those spaces in the way they would have been in the 19th century. So that's one of the ways we tried to create an immersive environment for our visitors coming into the new experience. Um, one of the things we also did, um, we did, we have a several audio, audio visual elements that we were able to develop mm -hmm. during the course of the process. Um, we also, we have two films at the site, one that kind of asks challenging piercing questions about Lee and his place in history, but the other film, The Legacy of Arlington House, we were able to interview 
um, descendants like uh, Steve Hammond, as well as his relatives, uh, Donna Kunkel and Craig Syfax, along with Inez Parks, to really um, get their perspectives on the impact that this place, that place, this place has had on them. And that was one of the things I think we were all most proud of as a part of our design process. And I should say, I'm talking like we're actually finished with the project. We actually have the installers on site this week, putting a few finishing touches. So we're <laughs> almost, but not quite done. Um, but um, you know, it's been quite a learning experience, uh, quite a journey. You know, as Jesse said, you know, we had everything from the technical de technical details, like um, choosing the colors and the palette and the design, um, to defining out the themes of each scene, as we call them. Each building is a scene. Um, to thinking about all those, like in the larger perspectives and the general story that we were trying to tell, um, to really create a sense again, as I said earlier, of place and what it would have been like on this antebellum plantation leading up to the American Civil War. Um, so hopefully we've uh, managed to convey that. We'll see, we just open, but it's been quite the journey. You know, I think the collaboration in both places has been really good. I mean, working with Jesse and the team there a few years ago was was really fascinating because it was iterative in terms of, you know, kind of asking people in those spaces in terms of, how, well, what do you think about this? And then coming back to them and then working with Kim, I think that that uh, um, historian's roundtable was really an important piece in terms of getting people who perhaps are looking at this site in different ways to talk to one another. And sometimes that doesn't happen. And so to have that opportunity early on as you're thinking about that, I think, uh, you know, really has a positive impact. No, and I'm glad that you think that, Steve. I know one of the thing, ways I think we fell down a little bit is we started off with huge momentum and we tried yeah. to keep it going. But yeah. one of the problems we have as a government agency is we have a lot of turnover. Right. <laughs> and That's we true. Have, and almost everyone who was originally involved in that original kickoff has moved on to other positions within the right. park service. Yep. So the level of continuity was definitely one of our challenges, but yeah. you need it. That's true. <laughs> I love that. It's almost like you're describing somebody building a house from scratch and you have to decide, you know, what kind of fixtures are we going to have? What color is this uh, wallpaper going to be? You know, it's like, what kind of carpeting? Are we going to go hardwood? Are we going to go, you know, X, Y, and Z? Um, speaking of all of these wonderful things that are happening or what's happening in the middle of the pandemic, um, which cause a lot of challenges, do you want to share with us some of the biggest challenges for sites like Mount Vernon and Arlington House um, when interpreting slavery? Um, that particular topic. Jessica, would you like to speak to that first? Yeah, um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of challenges, you know, in different arenas. Um, you know, this this history is, is challenging. Um, it's difficult for a lot of people to hear for different reasons. Um, and so, you know, considering how to present the information in ways that, you know, will invite people to learn and discover and not alienate them or, um, you know, uh, turn them off, um, mm -hmm. as well as to tell the story in a way that is, you know, respectful to the legacy of enslaved people, um, you know, including ancestors, um, descendants' voices as we're talking about their ancestors, mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking about those very different audiences as you're putting together, you know, a single narrative in an exhibit um, is a really challenging task. And it's also, you know, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but, you know, interpreting slavery in general has a lot of challenges just because the information is often very fragmentary. I mentioned we're fortunate to have a lot of information, but yeah. even then it's still often pretty incomplete. You know, you may know certain things, but there are other things that that you don't know. And so coming up with a cohesive narrative and presenting that information when there are big gaps can be can be a challenge. And as we've said too, you know, there aren't really documents written by enslaved people themselves for the most part. There aren't images of them. Um, there, aside from archeology, span there often aren't objects or surviving artifacts that they owned. And so coming up with a way to present their stories, make them, you know, real fully rendered individuals um, for our visitors um, to, to mm -hmm. engage with their stories, that comes with a lot of challenges because, you know, you don't have the material that you're working with with somebody like George or Martha Washington. Um, so those are just a few of, of the challenges that we encountered. Nah, that's nothing at all, right? <laughs> that's not challenging at all. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> Kimberly, did you um, experience anything um, in addition to that or pretty much um, basically the same things? Well, oh, well, at, we definitely experienced um, some challenges similar to that. And I will add that obviously the one of our biggest challenges, of course, is that the name of Arlington House is Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial. And of course, mm -hmm. even when we started planning to manage <laughs> the views and perspectives and conversations surrounding mm -hmm. Confederate memorials and monuments has really um, had an impact on how we've developed our project and our exhibit. Um, we, when we kicked off our project and really got really started to get into the process, of course, we had the tragedy in Charlottesville and the protests there. Yeah. And then from there, it's just, you know, the discussion continues to grow, perspectives continue to change, and we've had to really work with, when we were developing our exhibits, we had to really work to create a dialogic experience using a process called focus on audience centered experiences to really not so much tell people, but to give them information and give them a, a space and leverage to create a have a conversation and to really think about um, what this place, what do places like this mean and what impact do they have? Um, mm -hmm. One thing we did on our panels, to, on our exhibits to confront this topic is to have questions to get people to think about how this applies to modern day and how this is an ongoing challenge and conversation. And um, just on the kind of less, you know, impactful emotional side like that, um, you know, one of the things, you know, that as we were going through leveraging, we had to, again, as Jesse said, we didn't have a lot of documentation information when we were developing our exhibit. So we, um, through several important planning documents like our historic furnishings report and leveraging our museum collections and looking at you know from a material culture perspective we were able to for the first time really incorporate the archaeological legacy of the site right. and the collections there um and with the we also have a wonderful relationship with our partners in the descendant community both from the lee family and from families like the um Syphaxes and the grays and they were also able to loan objects associated with their families for us to showcase as well um so um, being able to leverage uh, material culture both through the traditional gallery exhibits as well as in the furnished period rooms, which include a mixture of reproduction mm -hmm. and original artifacts, um, was really, really something we had to work out, work on as well. Absolutely. You know, I, I think that the really tough parts are, are understanding the movements of the people that were there and recognizing that it's it's more than about the person who's on the marquee. And in the case of Arlington, it's uh, it's Robert E. Lee. And in the case of uh, Mount Vernon, it's George Washington. And, and how do you tell the story of all these people, uh, you know, that kind of take second seat to these folks? And, and I think that that's really an important part and something that we we struggle with and we we're working to get better at um you know with uh you know i think jesse mentioned the lost narratives that exist out there which is which is huge we just don't have a lot of information in that space and the other thing that i think is a difference between the two sites is that um mount vernon is is interpreting a point in time you know you think about 1799 and this is where we're at and this is george george washington passes away and it kind of goes from there and then we talk about the enslaved being distributed amongst people and it's like that's the end of the story um mm -hmm. you know, the thing the thing at uh, um, uh, arlington is that it, it really is more of a timeline because it includes uh you know uh, the, the the struggles with uh, robert e lee in terms of him making his decision and you know what happens during the civil war so if that's a little more of a timeline that you can you know kind of do a little bit more in terms of diving into the lives of people and trying to understand from their perspective um i think one of the things that i just heard from a friend today that i i stole is that a lot of places were sitting on history you know, there are stories that are out there that, uh, you know, about enslaved people that we do know that don't necessarily get all the attention that they should. And so I, I think that one of the challenges that sites like both of these places have is that we have history that doesn't always make it into the light. And, and I think that that's a really important part. And I don't know, leading to the next point, whether that's, you know, a bias that we have in terms of we want history to, to feel a certain way and we want our visitors to leave with a certain feeling this kind of history is not comfortable. And so how we deal with that and how we help people start to get comfortable with the biases that they a lot of times don't, or also I'll add myself to that, the biases mm -hmm. that we have that, that, that we don't realize, I think is an important part of that. And um, Kim's point about the, the audience centered experiences is really important because it tries to raise awareness so that people leave with a different perspective than they came with. Yeah. And then I think the last thing that I would add here is that, you know, in interpreting slavery through George Washington's eyes is through his eyes. 
It doesn't yeah. talk about how it is to be an enslaved person working for George Washington. Yeah. And so, and you you know that space, Brenda, in terms of, yes. of you know, how do you, you know, how, how does it feel to be, you know, that kind of uh -huh. thing. And so um, I think that exhibits like this have a hard time because we don't have that kind of information and all we can use is ancillary data to kind of get a feel for how these people actually uh, survived and and worked through this space. And so those are, I think, are big challenges in terms of trying to provide accurate information in these spaces. No, no, yeah. absolutely. I think I was going to say really quickly, I know, and I remember we were in the middle, midway through the process, um, Steve made a good point that we really didn't talk about the prehistoric history of the site and history of right. indigenous, the people, indigenous people. And that was just something in our own bias that we didn't even think to include because we're so focused on, you know, the years leading up to the war and what happened to those who were once enslaved right. after the war that we didn't even think about that previous era. And that's mm -hmm. something that we have to think about when we're talking about temporary experience, temporary exhibits and how to continue our work in the, in the outgoing years. So that's yeah, great, great, great point, Kim. And that's why it's so important to have so many different voices at the table, you know, especially early on in a project, because, you know, these questions will be raised and you, know, you never know what will really change the direction that you're going in or what will, you know, alter your perspective in some really important way. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's an excellent point, Jesse. And speaking to that, can you um, tell the viewers out there a little bit about how um, sites like Arlington House and Mount Vernon, how specifically we get to work with wonderful people like Mr. Steve Hammond here? <laughs> Yeah, well, I've talked a little bit about how, you know, we were so fortunate to work with the descending community, with people like Steve, as we were developing the exhibition. Um, you know, it was a an honor to be able to do those oral history um, interviews and, and create that video. And um, the video is available on our website in addition to being at the end of the exhibition. So um, anyone can view it even after the exhibit closes. And those interviews are also the video itself is only about 20 minutes long. It features excerpts from the interviews, but the full interviews are saved in our archives. So those, you know, exist as oral histories, as, you know, historical documentation that is really important. And, you know, those will be kept for future research. Um, so that was, you know, a really critical part of the whole exhibition project that, you know, will live on in perpetuity. We also wanted to make sure that you know, this outreach was not just a, a one-time project specific thing, but that it you know, was sustained um, and continued to be part of our, our mission here. And so, um, you know, Brenda and Steve, you can actually probably speak more to this, but uh, it's been so exciting to see, you know, Brenda, you take on your new role, um, helping to coordinate Descendant Outreach. And then yeah. um, Steve, I know that you've been, helping to lead the creation of a, a descendants group that will, um, you know, facilitate communication among that community. Um, and so it's been just really exciting to see how the exhibit has kind of become a launching point for some of these longer term, um, really important developments. Exactly. 100%. It's like, I, I love the simple fact that uh, you were, we were wise enough to realize that we needed to engage um, these community of descendants and people that were still here to tell their stories, to share their stories and everything. And I'm sure that you probably had a very similar experience as well, Kim? Yes, absolutely. Um, for us, you know, as an agency, um, we, you know, it's been a series of building blocks to get to where we are today. As I mentioned earlier, it started with special programs and special events where we would reach out to the descendant community and have them out for like musical music performances. We even had a reenactment of the Cypex wedding that took place. Yeah. So special events like that. And from there with the um, kind of launch of the design process for the exhibit, we were able to engage even further with our partners in the descendant community like Steve and many other folks um, as well. And that was another stepping stone, a huge really expansion of our efforts that have been going on by many, that been put forth by many people over the years. Um, following that, as a part of our just building on that exhibit process, we started a community practice that include um, wonderful folks right. like Jesse and Steve, where we really tried to build upon that engagement and hopefully we'll work to continue to build community curated exhibits because that was one of the goals of the project as well, to really have the community have a voice in what we're doing at Arlington House. Um, and then um, in recent, on the last few, last year or so, um, 
our superintendent's office is really built upon those early efforts with the exhibit and with the interpreter staff to really facilitate a dialogue with the descendant community, um, both from the Lee Custis side as well as from the mm -hmm. descendants of the enslaved. And they've really made huge strides working with the descendants and creating a dialogue and talking about a lot of the legacies of the past and how they can work towards a better future. Um, and they've been really doing great engagement work there. Um, so that's just a snippet of everything that's been going on. And I'm sure Steve can speak to that even more than I could. So. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just simply add that, uh, you know, since last uh, December or late November, uh, I, I've been working with a couple of other people to basically help to bring uh, descendants of uh, enslaved at Mount Vernon together to, to, to begin a conversation. I give a lot of credit mm -hmm. to uh, the Mount Vernon in terms of the education department and you, Brenda, in, in terms of the support that you've provided. And we've spent the last several months trying to figure out what we wanted to be. And we actually, in the last uh, meeting that we had, which was last Saturday, decided on a, a logo and we are calling ourselves the League of Descendants of the Enslaved of Mount Vernon. And so we, we ta -da, so this is the marquee. I'm rolling it out right now. Here it is. And we um, are a group of about 40 some odd people who have an interest to have a connection to Mount Vernon in some way. And uh, we, we hope to hear the word again, amplify our voices in terms of, you know, the things that we, uh, you know, want to learn about our own backgrounds uh, in terms of research and, and education offices helping us with that. And then also, how can we provide a feedback mechanism for uh, our, for uh, you know Mount Vernon uh, in terms of the kinds of things that we're talking about with the exhibit and 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 how we can help improve the visitor experience uh, with regard to that. Over on the uh, Arlington side, I am just so excited. We you know as the house was getting close to reopening, you know a couple of times, and then we started talking about this in late December and early January, you know we basically asked the question of the park service, how are we going to get the descendant families together? Mm -hmm. And the park service basically went away and said, we are willing to help facilitate a conversation amongst the family members. And since about, I'll say late February, early March, we have created a descendants, a descendants circle in which we are getting together on a regular basis to simply get to know each other. And this includes Lees and it includes, uh, you know, members of the Syfaxes, the Grays, the Norrises, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, it's really a, a wide open group. And, and we're working to try to just bring this, you know, we think about the trajectories in which, you know, the, the Lees were on and, and all the African-American and, and uh, um, enslaved descendants were on. And, and it's amazing to see this come back together again. So mm -hmm. we hope that this builds into something that's really very powerful in terms of voices and, and how we can change the trajectory of this country as a whole. Excellent. <laughs> I did want to just highlight, I'm sorry, Brenda, really quickly. Um, the, also the great work that Steve has been doing as a member of the descendant community with our mm -hmm. our friends group, the Arlington House Foundation. Him and a team of other members have been really trying to change and expand their original mission and traditional goals of the board to um, really, mm -hmm. really address this new interpretive focus and narrative happening on the Park Service side. And he's been really doing great work as a member of the descendant community Thanks. with that as well. So kudos to Steve. Thanks, Kim. I mean, the goal here is to broaden the narrative so that it's more yeah. inclusive of what it of, of what it's been and and if we can get there i think that we can make a really big difference mm -hmm. oh this is wonderful this is so exciting now i've been telling people all week long as i posted the wonderful um the lives bound together you know the exhibit coming to the close and i'm saying the bird is leaving the nest the bird is leaving the nest and people are oh, I'm so sad <clears throat> The good thing about the bird leaving the nest is the bird is not dead. The bird is going <laughs> other places. <laughs> you know, it's a let's, wonderful. Let's hope not. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. You know, it's a wonderful thing. Um, Jesse, can you please tell us what's coming next after Lies Bound Together closes on July 11th? Everybody, um, and also be start putting your questions in the um the chat, people, if you want us um anybody on the panel to answer a question for you. But come, 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 come. Let's hear. <laughs> yeah, so we have a lot of things planned. Um, 
For one thing, we even after the physical exhibit closes, we will have a virtual version of the exhibit. No. So um, we've done 360 degree panoramic photography. So you can basically walk through the exhibit virtually. Yes. Um, and there you can kind of click on cases and objects and silhouettes and read more about the, yes. the, the content that is presented there. Mm -hmm. So basically the entire exhibit is digitized in that way. So it will live on. Um, in that format. We're also planning a podcast, which is inspired by the, um, the exhibit. It will be, I think, seven episodes. It's um, mm -hmm. coming out of our, our um, digital media team at the library. Yes. Um, the Washington Library. And that will be coming out um, hopefully in the fall. Um, and so we're interviewing a lot of experts, historians, and we'll be interviewing descendants as well um, to kind of present this information, these narratives in a, a new format that will be mm -hmm. widely available. Um, we're also, um, and this is probably the, the most common question I get is what's happening in the museum after Lives Man Together closes. And we'll be reinstalling the museum with an exhibit that focuses on the history of Mount Vernon as a place. So that will include a lot of different narratives, including the narrative of the enslaved, um, including um, the narrative of indigenous people who were on the land thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. Of course, also including the narrative of George Washington. Um, but then we also are talking about how Mount Vernon was saved and preserved. So we are talking about the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and their stewardship of the property. Um, so that will be kind of a more wide ranging exhibition, but will, it will include a lot of these stories and a lot of um, the same information. So slavery is not going away. We're not gonna stop talking about slavery. Um, and, and to that point, we are also looking at how we can revamp the signage and panels that are in the historic area around the mansion and around the outbuildings, which is where mm -hmm. um, almost all of our visitors go. Actually, only 20% of our visitors go through the museum. Yeah. So, you know, that's still a large number of people, but we the exhibit did not reach everybody who came to Mount Vernon. Um, but by putting things in, in other areas um, where our, most of our visitors are circulating, we hope that we can get some of this information out to an even wider audience. So we're looking at ways that we can kind of revamp both the furnishings and the interpretation um, to reflect some of this more recent research. We're also, um, you know, this list goes on and on. So we have a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have the, um, archaeological survey of the cemetery that was used by the enslaved and the African-American community. That's been going on for a number of years and that is ongoing. So that's a really exciting project that, you know, is gathering more information about this place that was sacred to the enslaved community here. And is it really important because it was one of the only places where they were in control. Mm -hmm. um, so that, is you know a project that's continuing, um, so that's really exciting. We're also hoping in um, the coming year to start expanding that database that we were talking about earlier, and particularly looking at connections to sites like Arlington House, and mm -hmm. using the records that exist in those places to try to you know make connections because you know the people who were at Mount Vernon, a lot of them were also the people who were at Arlington House, and so. Yeah. They, you know, combining those records, we can really track people's lives, you know, and to a much fuller extent. And there are several other sites that are associated with the Custis family, like Tudor Place and Woodlawn. Right. And then there are also earlier records, kind of pre-George and Martha Washington marriage records from the Custis family um, and from Washington's um, mm -hmm. relatives that can bring in that earlier side of the story. So we hope to expand the database to provide a you know, more holistic view of how this community came to be and what happened to these individuals. Um, and then we um, are also um, just looking at my list because I wouldn't have been able to remember all of this. Um, and I think we covered, I was going to mention the descendants group, but I think we covered that already. So um, we that's, have that's a lot a big of, deal. yeah, yeah, that's incredibly exciting. Um, and that is, you know, I think one of the most important things coming out of this is to really make sure that, you know, these relationships and our um, commitment to honoring the voices of the descendants, um, you know, remains intact and is, is not just something we did for the exhibit, but is something that we will continue to do. So, um, you know, that's all what's on tap and we're really excited about um, what the future holds.
<laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, you're excited. I'm excited. <laughs> and it seems like everybody else, um, all of our viewers are also excited. So we're going to go ahead and start fielding some questions. Let's see what's going on here. Um, Ms. Jans Hoskins says, will Mount Vernon and Arlington have a rotational exhibit um, exhibitions in order to showcase the history that is being sat on? And as a new data is as new data is being discovered or interpreted. Um, let me see. Well, we have rotational exhibits. Well, let's speak to the two um, curators here. <laughs> yeah. So we, um, yeah. in the new museum installation, there will be a section that um, is for temporary exhibits. So we'll definitely be able to showcase. Um, new discoveries, new research as it comes about. Um, and we also have our website as a really great platform to share things. You know, when we aren't able to do a physical exhibit, um, we can always put information online. So there are a lot of different forms um, for us to share that. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry, Brenda. Um, and I would just tack on to that. Um, same here um, as a part of our fabrication and design process um, for the new exhibits that just went in our Arlington House. We incorporated space for two temporary rotating exhibit cases um, mm -hmm. to be able to again enhance and continue our plans to do community engagement and also to highlight new discoveries that were made during the course of the rehab and the exhibit design process. Um, for example, we made during the course of the exhibit, we made during the course of the project, we made several archaeological discoveries tied to the African American history at the site, in particular mm -hmm. in the South slave quarters with the Gray family. And we also made some discoveries tied to President Washington and some of the materials that were once at Mount Vernon that were brought to um, to the house by Custis. Um, so those are definitely discoveries that we we'll wanna highlight moving forward in the years to come. And we're very excited by the possibilities. And um, due to our limited space, um, we also definitely intend to leverage the virtual media space as well. Excellent. So I'll, I'll, I'll add just a couple things here. Uh, you know, with regard to the uh, um, the League of Descendants there at Mount Vernon, uh, we, we basically have kind of broken our, our, our group up into three components. One is kind of structure, the next is education, and the next is communication, with the goal being, you know, how do we help, um, you know, Mount Vernon with the educational components, and how do we help educate ourselves and the public? And clearly, we want to be able to communicate that to the public. So creating liaison with, uh, you know, the ladies of Mount Vernon, I think it's going to be an important part of this in terms of how do we make sure sure that voices are not lost. One of the things I'm really excited about, I'm surprised that Kim didn't say this, but she's too modest, but she is actually, we've talked about this in the community of practice there of what kind, what do we do with rotating exhibits? And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm honored that we have been talking about one of the first exhibits being one on the Cyfaxes, which I've been putting together, which will be a uh, an exhibit that speaks to the Cyfaxes who have served our country. You know, what better place to talk about the Cyfaxes mm -hmm. and people who have served yeah. there than those people that have served in, in multiple wars uh, and conflicts, and then dealing with the issues associated with color in, in, in the various aspects there. So mm -hmm. we're, we're I, I don't know about you, Kim, but I am really excited about that exhibit. And as soon as things settle down there, we want to get that that installed. It never settles down. I've been saying that for years and it's never been the case. Um, but you no, know, the exhibit that Steve mentions is really going to hopefully be a great um, experience because it's in an area of the site where we talk about what happened to those, the descendants of those who were once enslaved at Arlington. And that's fits in perfectly in with that overarching theme of that space. So it's very exciting opportunity. The last thing I wanted to add with with my comments was that, you know, as I as I think about this this space called uh, Cyfax Pathfinders, I'm looking to try to use this concept of the scenic byway. You know, I, I threw out the, the, the Cyfax scenic byway. I think that there is space for all of these historic sites to do a better job of helping the visitor know that there's information someplace else. So as they are at Mount Vernon, they want to know what happened at Tudor or what they want to have what happened at, at Arlington House. And I think the same way with the Cater House and the same way with Arlington, that I think we have a responsibility as partners to be able to, you know, help the public who's here to visit for two days or whatever. What do I need to see? And recognize mm -hmm. that the story does not stop at Mount Vernon. That's right. It, 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 there, there are all these lives that are interconnected that I think uh, we want to try to tell a better story at and and showcase uh, what we know about about this part of our our community. Excellent, beautiful. Um, 
Matt Costello wants to know, why are some historic sites, institutions, and people so resistant to teaching these stories? Um, any answers, perhaps? <laughs> I know we kept saying, um, we kept talking about this being considered as difficult history and that it is challenging. Um, I personally, as a historic character interpreter, I find that a lot of times visitors and guests have a um, challenge accepting new information or new knowledge um, and they seem to um, push away or they'll get um, an antagonistic or they're in, you know, in a state of denial, you know, um, before, you know, they finally, you know, bargain their way through it and they finally come to acceptance. And so any information that you're being introduced to in an environment that is unexpected or that's not your traditional learning environment, it can definitely cause some probably inter, inner conflict <laughs> with, um, with your world altogether, with what do we call it? Um, that cognitive dissonance, to where you're, you know, what you believe you know conflicts mm -hmm. with what is being introduced to you, and so the two exactly. just kind of they kind of fight just a little bit, just a little bit, <laughs> maybe a lot, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you know, a lot. A bit, yeah. What do I you mean that... Santa Claus isn't real? <laughs> No, it, I think that's especially true for sites that are centered around one person and one person's story for so long. And, you know, yes. for us in particular, we have a figure that's due to a lot of different narratives throughout American history, the yes. lost cause narrative and the myths that surround Robert E. Lee. A lot of people grow up having a certain perception of him and his place in American history. So when you start to challenge that and to maybe provide different perspectives and provide a different lens into what he did throughout his life and the impact that that continues to have, that can challenge people's worldview and create to create a space where you have potential conflict. It's definitely a challenge. I, I think, think it's just human nature. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was just gonna say, uh, sorry, go, go, ahead. Go, go ahead, Jaycee, go ahead, go ahead. Um, certainly, well, just to build off what Kim and Brenda were saying, certainly with somebody like George Washington, who is you know, probably the most universally celebrated figure in American history, it can, be difficult for some people to consider how his legacy may be complex in certain ways and, you know, mm -hmm. may not be, you know, an entirely celebratory story. Um, so people who come in, you know, prepared to celebrate Washington and to have, you know, a, you know, simple heroic narrative, I think can be resistant to learning things that may, you know, challenge that narrative, as you said, Brenda. Um, and I think some institutions, you know, are, don't want to, you know, disappoint or upset visitors and so shy away yeah, from those exactly. stories. But of course, exactly. you know, our role is to to teach, you know, the history and to tell an accurate and authentic story. And so, you know, we have to talk about these things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that, uh, yeah. you know, people who are curating these things and the interpreters are given the training that they need to be able to have these conversations. I mean, Brenda, you're mm -hmm. out there with the public every day. You know, some days it's more stressful than others in terms yeah. of people that you're dealing with, but not everybody has the skill sets that you have in terms of being able to respond to somebody who either doesn't want to believe or how do you mm -hmm. help them see the world a little bit differently? You know, yeah. uh, you know, when, when we think about uh, the fact that George Washington was moving people around in order to avoid, you know, freeing people, you know, that's something that some people have no clue it was really yeah. the case. And, and yeah. those are the kinds of stories that if we're going to tell the whole story, they're really important to be there. And, yeah. and so we have to, we have to get more comfortable with how we uh, convey that and, and engage with people. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, absolutely. Great, and great it, question, Matt. Great question. And I would just say a lot of it's also just the evolution of how we view about these topics as a society. If you had visited mm -hmm. Arlington House in the 90s, the slave quarters were called the servants' quarters. And they would barely even want to, you know, talk about slavery and the staff were not encouraged to do so besides a few trailblazers. And, right. you know, it really, you know, that's a part of it as well that we have to account for. Yes, yes. And I love the fact that we are up for that challenge. I, I, I admire you, Jesse, um, for using the word challenge, 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 because I like challenge as opposed to, you know, it's like, it's, it's hard. <laughs> like hard yeah. is so 
you know, it's like yeah. so final and so definitive. But when you say challenge, I'm just like, yes, I'm ready. On your mark, set, yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Bring it, bring it on. <laughs> yeah. Bring it Come on. on. <laughs> Come at me, bro. Um, <laughs> Thank you so very much, Matt, for that wonderful question. Um, Louise Williams says, is there any possibility that you would publish a book with pictures or artifacts that were on display, graphics and important facts posted about this history? <gasps> so curious that she would mention that. Oh, Don't you have a beautiful? That um, so happened. <laughs> I know. I wish, I wish I had it to show you, but we do yeah. have publication. I have. Um, <laughs> Uh, that came out. I know. I think she has it. Yay. Both of us are looking at our stack. Oh, no, that's not it. That but one. that is another oh. wonderful one. Oh, that's the other one. <laughs> um, but yes, we did have a publication that came out with the exhibition. Okay, let's do that There's, one. Yes. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. I was like, where is it? So that yeah. one, that um, book features um, essays that uh, cover a lot of the topics in the exhibition, as well as extended biographies of all the people who are featured mm -hmm. as silhouettes, so you can learn more about their lives. Um, and it also has two essays from uh, members of the descendant community, um, Rahul Minkwander and Zuni Matima. So um, it's a really great kind of encapsulation of what we're trying to do with the exhibition, and it's available, as you can see, um, to purchase online, and it's also in our gift shop. So um, yes. we did. I've we got did it on my that. bookshelf. <laughs> I do <did> too. <laughs> As we still be, so thank you, Jesse. Multiple copies, and I also wanted to let the people know, um, the viewers know. Uh, you know, when um, in launching the virtual exhibit or the virtual tour, I'm super excited when anything comes up virtually because I'm that kind of person that gets frustrated when I get this close to something and the alarms start going beep, 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 beep. So <laughs> the good thing about doing the virtual tour is you can enlarge the artifacts and the documents as large as your screen yeah. can handle. You can get up close and personal and intimate with these things, just short of actually handling them. Again, um, we dropped the link um, to the virtual tour um, in, in the comments, in the box below and everything. And I believe that was probably the end of the questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, unless we have some more questions. Um, everybody for coming and viewing um, with us today. Do we have another question? Yes, let's do another question from one of our top fans. This is Ms. Scarlett Enstag. Um, what ways can the general public contribute to or promote the continued research into the enslaved community of Mount Vernon? How can we get even more involved? See, people like a challenge. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Um, so, um, what, um, ladies, um, and 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 you as well, Steve. Um, what are some things that we can, you know, we can definitely? I'm sorry, you know, I have nothing but love for you. Um, <laughs> what are some ways that we can, as visitors, as fans of these places, um, actually help, um, you know, uh, to promote um, these places and to make sure that the word actually gets out into you know into the rest of the world does anybody have any suggestions of course visitation getting a membership <laughs> yes certainly spreading the word about these projects to your friends and family letting people know um you know that they're happening just so we can raise awareness and increase the number of people that we reach um in terms of specific involvement and volunteer opportunities. Um, the archeological survey at the cemetery has been operating almost entirely with volunteers. Uh, I don't know when they're resuming again um, post pandemic, but um, it's right. uh, worth reaching out. Um, I'm happy to connect anyone with the, the right folks because um, that's a really exciting way to really get your hands dirty literally and you know yeah. um, get very involved in, in that project. Um, and then uh, we may have other opportunities for volunteers, you know, as we do things like expanding the database, um, you know, that requires a lot of labor. And so we may, we may have calls for volunteers for projects like that. So just, you know, stay tuned to Mount Vernon's, you know, website and social media, we'll post information there. Um, and we love to have people interested. So thank you so much. Yes. And I was Don't say, if you're not following Mount Vernon on social media, you should. They have yes. a great, very strong social media presence that we aspire to 
<laughs> yes, it's coming. So remember, like, like Kim just said, like, share, and subscribe, everybody out there. Under the sounds of my voice, like, share, and subscribe. I should be able to see you <laughs> when I go on Facebook. I want to see those names. <laughs> I want you to see you That's sharing amazing. all of the events that go on here at Mount Vernon. Again, thank you so very much. This has been a wonderful opportunity for me to get to know a little bit more detail about the wonderful goings on at both of these locations and all of these locations. Thank you so much for giving of your time and your evening. It has been an absolute and wonderful pleasure. Um, yes. <laughs> and from Mount Vernon, thank you all of the viewers out there and all of the supporters out there. Remember again, um, we are available online, so many different media platforms. You absolutely have no excuse to not know as much as you possibly can about the lives of these people and other people in our American history. Thank you again for joining us. <laughs> Bye. Congratulations, Jesse. Yeah, congratulations. Yay!